Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Anjali Avihing Sanon from HIPNET Thai Red Cross Ace Research Bank uh, from Bangkok, Thailand. And I'm here with uh, my co-chair, Dr. S. Chiwao uh, Nunes from uh, Infectious Disease uh, from Brazil. Uh, so for this section, we're going to have uh, five interesting uh, topics to discuss today. For East Center, you have about 10 minutes for present and also five minutes for uh, question and answer. So we welcome all questions from, from the audience. Just start now, so just... Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, for the next, uh, the first presentation will be a hepatitis C care cascade for people living with HIV in the country of Georgia, and, and that will be presented by Nicolos. Nicolos is uh, from the National Infectious Disease Center in Georgia. So good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to thank conference organizers and scientific committee for selecting our work for oral presentation here. It is indeed a great privilege. My co-authors and I have no conflicts of interest. So let me start with some background information about Georgia and then about uh, briefly about HIV and HCV epidemics in the country. Uh, Georgia is an independent in, uh, Eastern European nation situated on the Black Sea coast between Russia and Turkey. It is a small country with a population of 3.7 million people. Georgia has one of the highest prevalence of HCV infection in the world, and I believe it's highest in the WHO European region. Recent population-based survey conducted in, co in collaboration with US CDC in 2015 showed that 5.4% of adult general population, that is 150,000 persons, have chronic hepatitis C. HIV is less common with an estimated 9,600 persons living with the disease, but as you can see, less than half of them are aware of their HIV status. For many years, the HIV epidemic in Georgia was driven by injection drug use, but over the uh, last decade, we see the shift to, towards um, uh, sexual routes of transmission with the respective decline in IDU-related cases. The prevalence of HCV infection um, uh, in, a, in diagnosed HIV persons is 34%, and the end-stage liver disease due to HCV is the second leading cause you know, of death among people living with HIV in the country. Georgia has made significant progress in scaling up access to HCV treatment. It started in 2011 with a free dual therapy program for HIV, HCV co-infected patients, primarily supported by the Global Fund. It was followed by the free program for prisoners in 2013 and culminated with the launch of World's First Hepatitis C Elimination Program in April 2015. The elimination program was possible through a strong political will of the Georgian government and a partnership with US CDC and Gilead Sciences, which committed to donate its direct antivirals at no cost. So currently, we are treating all HCV, uh, HCV patients in Georgia, including HIV, HCV co-infected uh, person, persons. So objective of our study was to evaluate engagement across the HCV care continuum among people living with HIV in the country. A study including all adult persons ever diagnosed with HIV and known to be alive by September 2016. Data on these patients were extracted from the National AIDS Health Information System, which is a secure web-based electronic system collecting information on every reported case of HIV infection. We quantified the following stages of care, uh, estimated number of HIV, HCV co-infected persons, diagnosed both for HIV and HCV, treated for HCV infection, and achieved sustained virological response. Spectrum software was used to estimate the number of people living with HIV, and the number of HIV, HCV co-infected persons was calculated based on the observed HCV prevalence and spectrum-derived estimate of HIV population. The standard of HCV care and HIV patients include routine screening for HCV antibodies, followed by the HCV RNA testing, of course, if HCV uh, antibody positive, and then followed by HCV genotyping and the liver fibrosis assessment. HIV treatment is freely available for HIV patients since 2011. Initially, it was a combination of pegylated interferon and ribavirin. 
So first Guru was introduced in 2015 as part of the uh, national illumination program, uh, and it was used in combination with PEG RIBA or with RIBA iron only. And finally, starting from March 2016, all patients are now started on Ledipasvir Sofosvir based regimens. So moving to results. Based on the 34% prevalence of, uh, of HCV infection, we estimate that out of 9,600 9, persons living with HIV in Georgia, 3,300 are also co-infected with HCV. Among them, only 33% were diagnosed both for HIV and HCV, with around 2,200 persons remaining undiagnosed. Among those with living with undiagnosed uh, HIV, HCV co-infections, more than 1,900 were not aware of their HIV status, and estimated 280 persons were diagnosed for HIV and not for, uh, but not for HCV. Overall, undiagnosed HIV uh, accounted for 87 percent of the gap in this stage. At the time of analysis, 697 persons were treated for HCV infection with either PEGRIBA or DA-based regimens. Namely, 366 persons were treated with PEGRIBA, 277 received DA-based regimens, and 54 were treated with DAAs after the failure of dual therapy. And finally, among those eligible for SVR assessment, 480 persons achieved clear the virus, achieved SVR, which is 44% of the diagnosed uh, persons, and only 15% of total estimated number of people living with dual infection. Uh, the slide shows updated preliminary data for June 2017, shown in red font here, just about the uh, cascade uh, columns. As we actively continue our program, the numbers are increasing on a daily basis, literally on a daily basis for each stage of um, the HCV care continuum. Um, we are particularly well progressing on the right side after the diagnosis. So far, we managed to treat 70% of the uh, total diagnosed population, and more than half of those diagnosed are, are already cured. Nevertheless, even, even with the improved numbers, now at the end, the uh, only minority of the HIV, HCV co-infected population in Georgia is cured, primarily because of the gap in the stage of diagnosis. I would like to briefly overview treatment outcomes. This is the data for tre uh, treatment with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. Uh, overall, 420 persons started treatment from 2011 until the start of the national elimination program in 2015. Overall, SVR rate was 44%. Um, all those patients failing on dual therapy are now uh, retreated with the DA-based regimens, showing pretty high QR rates. This is the data of treatment outcomes of DA-based regimens, of course, which of course achieved a significantly higher SVR rate as compared to the dual therapy, with an overall SVR of 89%. Um, the response rates were particularly high among patients receiving the deepest response with based regimens, approaching 99%. The Lipasvir Sofosvir was effective in all genotypes, including genotype 2 and genotype 3, and most importantly, the drug was equally effective in cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic patients. We no longer use um, the combination of Sofosvir with interferon or ribavirin, and all patients failing on these uh, regimes are now retreated with harmonin. Updated data also indicates that the high QR rate persisted in June 2000, by June 2017 as well, and we continue to work hard towards um, ensuring um, uh, high Q, that, that the high QR rates are maintained, are maintained in the long term as well. Our analysis has strengths and limitations. Uh, the strengths of our analysis is the reliance of the national AIDS, on the national AIDS health information systems, which captures the information on all reported cases of HIV infection, and thus we had 100% representation of diagnosed HIV population. Uh, on the other hand, we might have missed people who were treated for HCV infection within the national elimination program without ever discovering their HCV status, H HIV status, but uh, curing only HCV uh, is not enough. Uh, I guess we all agree that uh, favorable outcomes can be achieved only if HIV is also well controlled. Another limitation is related to estimation of HIV, HCV co-infected population, which was based on the assumption that uh, HCV prevalence is the same in HIV diagnosed and undiagnosed persons, which might not be exactly true, and um, uh, this might have uh, overestimated our co-infected population. To account for this, we looked for uh, various scenarios, and even with the lowest possible HIV prevalence in undiagnosed, HIV undiagnosed persons, the major gap is still at the stage of diagnosis, and our conclusions of the study will be pretty much the same. 
In summary, uh, the major gap in HCV care cascade in Georgia is at the stage of diagnosis, primarily resulting from the undiagnosed HIV. Improving HIV diagnosis will be critical for reducing the number of HIV, HCV, the number of undiagnosed HIV, HCV co-infected persons, and for achieving population level impact of free HCV treatment program in Georgia. Finally, I would like to thank all our partners and sponsors who help us to deliver free HIV treatment to our patients, and also, I also would like to specifically acknowledge my colleagues and friends delivering HIV and HIV care services across the country. Thank you and appreciate your attention. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, the, the, this presentation now is open to debate. Is there uh, any questions? At the center? Uh, thanks for making a nice presentation, and I appreciate your country providing free treatment for the HCV infected patients. Uh, I have one, two questions. One is, uh, did you test these persons for hepatitis B because the roots can be common? This is number one. And number two is, are, were they getting treatment for HIV also? So thanks for the questions. Um, of course, we are testing them for hepatitis B. This is part of the HIV care in Georgia. They are screened for the hep B, HCV, and other, other infections, tuberculosis also. And they are getting respective care if they, are, you know, have, if, if they have other co-infections. And um, uh, with regard to HIV treatment, HIV and HCV care is integrated in Georgia. So it's, it's provided by the same physicians, by the same, by same centers. So it's, it's a one-shop, one one-stop uh, shop kind of approach. Any other question? Okay, thank you. So, so I'd just like to know about the, uh, the prevalence of hepatitis B co-infection with HIV in, in Georgia compared to hepatitis C? It's not that common as, uh, as hepatitis C. It's, it's really, it's around 5% uh, positivity of the uh, HBS uh, antigen positivity in HIV patients. And the triple co-infection is also really, really rare. It could be several cases, not, 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 not many cases of triple co-infection. My left. Georgia is a high prevalence setting for a, a tuberculosis as well. Do you have any experience with treating concomitant TB with the new drugs and hepatitis C? Yes, it is. Um, indeed, we are having the high prevalence of tuberculosis and the co-infection with HIV is also, uh, is, is also quite frequent. When we have the co-infection with tuberculosis, we just treat tuberculosis first and we just wait for uh, then treating for hepatitis C. Also, we had this several cases in, when we started this program with an, uh, the pegylated interferon back in 2011. We have um, seven, two or three cases of incident to tuberculosis developed while during on the treatment with uh, on pegylated interferon. But we don't see this, these cases much with DAA-based regimens. Any other questions? So? Yeah, uh, hi, uh, Chris Archibald from Canada. I noticed you started your cascade with a number who are both HIV and Hep C co-infected. Do you have a sense in uh, Georgia how many people have hepatitis C infection alone uh, without HIV infection? Uh, yes, so the, I started my presentation with background information. There are 150,000 persons who have the chronic hepatitis C in Georgia. Do they also have uh, free access to hep C treatment? Yes, so we, we are in, see, starting from April 2015, we are implementing the National Hepatitis C Elimination Program, which is supported by Gilead Sciences. And all of them uh, who are diagnosed have access to free drugs, free DAA drugs. Currently, this is Ladipasur Safosbury based treatment. Okay. Thank you, Nicholas. So, the uh, next speaker, Dr. Nadine uh, um, Confrit. She is an infectious disease specialist, and she is uh, working with the uh, Canadian Institute of Health and also working with the uh, McGill University Healthcare. So today she's going to present about the trend in cause-specific mortality in HIV hepatitis C co-infection uh, in Canada from 2003 to 2016, early impact of hepatitis C therapy. Nadine, please. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I'd like to start by thanking the conference organizers for inviting us to present the abstract here today. I have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. However, I am funded by the CIHR for a postdoctoral fellowship award. 
With the widespread use of combination antiretroviral therapy, there have been substantial declines in AIDS-related mortality. As a consequence, people living with HIV have seen impressive gains in life expectancy, resulting in the emergence of co-infections such as hepatitis C as an important cause of morbidity and mortality. Liver disease-related deaths account for approximately 25% of mortality in HIV hepatitis C co-infection. With the introduction of all oral DAAs achieving SVRs of greater than 85% in co-infected individuals, opportunities to reverse liver fibrosis and decrease liver-related sequelae and mortality rates have increased substantially. Determining which modifiable risk factors may contribute to excess mortality in co-infection will help address the potentially preventable causes of death. Accounting for these competing causes of death is absolutely necessary given the high risk from lifestyle exposures primarily related to risks associated with injection drug use seen in co-infection. Our study objectives were twofold. One, to examine cause-specific mortality among co-infected patients. And secondly, to evaluate changes in cause-specific mortality before and after the increase in treatment uptake among our co-infected patients. We use data from the Canadian co-infection cohort, which consists of 1,695 co-infected participants from 18 study sites across six provinces. This figure illustrates the diversity of the cohort in terms of demographics, risk factors, and geography across Canada. Participating centres include large urban ter tertiary care centres as well as street outreach programmes in an, in an attempt to capture a representative sample of the population in care. This cohort represents approximately one quarter of the co-infected population in Canada. Our primary outcome was cause of death, established with the code protocol, which involves the use of standardized case report forms by study sites to capture cause of death using death certificates, autopsy reports, etc. Linkage to provincial vital statistics was also available for our participants in order to identify causes of death for those who were lost to follow-up, i.e. those who have not been seen by a physician for over one year. We classified deaths according to five categories, end-stage liver disease, smoking-related deaths, including cardiovascular disease, drug overdose, other, and unknown. All cause and cause-specific event rates per 1,000 person years were estimated using Poisson regression, stratified by time and age. We used 2009 as the distinction between early and late time periods, as it was after this time point that treatment uptake increased dramatically in the CCC. In order to account for competing risks, a competing risk survival model was used to estimate the cause-specific hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals of time and age groups on cause of death. Cause-specific cumulative incidence functions, CIFs, from the cause-specific hazard ratios were then computed. We included a sample size of 1,477 patients who were followed for a median of 4.1 years. These are our baseline characteristics of all patients. As you can see, the majority had a history of injection drug use, alcohol use, and smoking. The majority were on CART, were virally suppressed, were HCV treatment naive, and had evidence of at least moderate fibrosis indicated by an APRI score of greater than 1.5. This figure shows the proportion of HCV RNA individuals who were treated and who achieved SVR by time period and age group stratified by APRI status, with red representing greater than 1.5 and blue less than or equal to 1.5. You can see here between 2003 to 2008, relatively few people were treated for hepatitis C, most of whom did not have advanced fibrosis, and SVR rates were low in both age groups, with 6% and 3% respectively in the younger and older age groups. Treatment and SVR rates increased substantially between 2009 to 2016, particularly among those with advanced fibrosis and among the older age group. For your curiosity, approximately 35% of all treatment courses were with direct anti acting antivirals. 203 patients died overall for a death rate of 30.5 per 1,000 person years, 
As you can see, the death rate decreased in both age groups from early to late time period. The median age at death was 47 years. You can see here that deceased patients were more likely to report active injection drug use, current smoking, a lower median CD4 cell count, they were less likely to be virally suppressed, have a longer duration of hepatitis C infection, were more likely to be treatment naive, and um, have advanced fibrosis indicative by an APRI of greater than 1.5 or a prior end-stage liver disease diagnosis. You can see here that end-stage liver disease was the most common cause of death in our cohort, followed closely by smoking-related causes and drug overdose. Despite record review, 25% of our cohort, um, we could not identify the cause of death in 25% of our cohort, although these individuals most um, closely resembled those who passed away from smoking-related causes, suggesting some of these may have been due to sudden cardiac death. Here are the unadjusted cost-specific event rates by all ages, young, and our older age groups. You can see here in red that deaths due to end-stage liver disease do not appear to have decreased over time. However, there was a notable decrease in end-stage liver disease deaths among those aged 50 to 80. Interestingly, end-stage liver disease was no longer the most common cause of death in the 2009 to 2016 period in either age group. Deaths due to smoking, seen in blue, have decreased with time. However, they still account for the number one cause of death among those aged 50 to 80 in the more recent time period. Finally, deaths due to overdose have decreased substantially over time. However, they still account for the most common cause of death among the 20 to 49-year-olds in the most recent time period. After accounting for competing risks from the early to late time period, you can see that deaths due to smoking-related causes and overdose have decreased statistic significantly over time. End-stage liver disease appears to have decreased over time, however, the confidence interval crosses one. Deaths due to end-stage liver disease were approximately five-fold more likely with an APRI greater than 1.5 and a positive HCV RNA, and almost four times more likely with a CD4 count of less than 350. In addition, the risk of death from all causes was higher in those with a positive HCV RNA at last visit. Here are the early and late CIFs vis-a-vis uh, -vis end stage liver disease. I'm going to be presenting these with respect to three individuals. Our first individual is the non-ideal participant, whose CD4 count is less than 350, who is not virally suppressed, and who has an APRI of greater than 1.5. The second individual is our, our ideal patient, whose CD4 count is greater than 350, virally suppressed, with no evidence of moderate liver fibrosis. The third individual is somewhere in between, whose HIV is well suppressed, but who has evidence of moderate fibrosis. You can see that for the ideal patient, deaths due to end-stage liver disease were very unlikely, even in the presence of a positive HCV RNA that you can see here. For patients in the third category, deaths due to end-stage liver disease were slightly more common, especially among those with a detectable HCV RNA. However, end-stage liver disease deaths declined um, between 2009 to 2016. For our non-ideal individual, you can see that deaths due to end-stage liver disease were very common, particularly among those with a detectable HCV RNA, uh, and there was no significant decrease in deaths in this group over time. The next two slides will be presenting the CIFs for smoking and overdose you will see that irrespective of being ideal or non-ideal or anywhere in between, deaths due to smoking-related causes and overdose are common, which can be explained by high baseline prevalences. We do, however, observe reductions in deaths due to both causes over time, which co coincided with moderate, modest reductions in smoking and injection drug use by our cohort participants between the two time periods.
strengths and limitations. Firstly, our study is one of the first studies examining causes, uh, cause-specific mortality and trends in cause-specific mortality in co-infected individuals in the DAA era, which also simultaneously accounts for competing causes of death. Limitations include, although our cohort is highly generalizable, our results are not generalizable to co-infected individuals who do not access care, for which mortality rates are expected to be even higher. Secondly, despite the use of standardized case report forms to qualify causes of death as accurately as possible, 25% of the causes of death were of unknown cause. The proportion of deaths of unknown cause, however, did decrease over time, suggesting that we are improving our determination of these causes. Finally, uh, although linkage to provincial vital statistics was only available for 68% of participants, we may, have missed, we may have thus missed deaths among those who were lost to follow-up. In conclusion, all-cause mortality decreased in both age groups over time, but still remains high. Declining death rates were explained by a reduction in mortality from a variety of competing causes, emphasizing the need to appropriately account for competing risks when evaluating the role of hepatitis C therapy. Furthermore, it is plausible that prolonged engagement in care with the availability of harm reduction and smoking cessation services may be in part responsible. We did not observe a significant decrease in end-stage liver disease deaths overall. However, death rates appear to be declining among our older age group, those in our cohort that have been successfully treated. Immediate impact of hepatitis C therapy will be most profound among those with advanced liver fibrosis, as demonstrated by the CIFs. Finally, we are unlikely to see any mortality benefit in the short term for individuals at low risk of end-stage liver disease. Those were our ideal or somewhere in between individual. Therefore, targeting modifiable risk factors such as substance abuse and tobacco smoking will have the greatest impact in this population. We have many individuals to thank, but I'd like to um, greatly acknowledge all the participants of the Canadian Co-Infection Cohort. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So um, it's time for question. I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes, is there any uh, specific guidelines uh, for HCV treatment in Canadian, uh, uh, some kind of restriction regarding uh, IDU, for instance? Injection drug use is not a contraindication to treatment. Um, however, uh, there are some studies that have demonstrated that there is some provider reluctance to treat infection in injection drug users. However, in Canada, it is not a contraindication to treatment. Is it because of the, the high rate of uh, uh, viral failure? Um, I mean, the, the viral undetectable in the patient who die. So this is because of the uh, poor adherence to ART or because of the uh, ART did not start it for this population? Because you have 65%, only 55% uh, of the, the patients who die have mm -hmm. viral load suppressed mm -hmm. compared to the patient who are alive. Are you, specific, are you addressing end-stage liver disease death specifically? Yeah. BV, uh, so for, for this uh, case, this is the death because of the HIV or because of the liver disease? Yeah, it's a good question. We know that definitely HIV uh, impacts the progression of hepatitis C and uh, r related sequelae and vice versa. We know that uh, the deaths um, among those who died of end-stage liver disease um, were individuals who actually did not achieve sustained virologic response. So those are the individuals who were not treated for hepatitis C. However, Un undoubtedly, there is an accelerating factor from the fact that they were not treated for their HIV as well. So, we don't have any more questions. So, thank you very much, thank Martin, you for your excellent talk. <laughs> we move on to.
the next speaker, Dr. Karen uh, uh, Lacombe. She's a well-known infectious disease from uh, uh, Paris, and um, she worked with the uh, HIV co-infection, and she also well-known uh, speaker for France and Sub-Saharan Africa. And she managed uh, HIV-infected patients and has uh, her PhD, uh, MPH and her PhD in epidemiology. So, welcome, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very nice introduction. So, on behalf of all my colleagues and the clinical centers, I'm very happy to present you the updated data regarding efficacy and safety of a new combination of the AA, Licaprevir, Pibrantasvir, and patients who are infected with hepatitis C virus and HIV, uh, which is called the Expedition 2 study. Here are disclosures of all the investigators. So a few key messages from the background. So in phase two and three studies, were almost 2,000 patients with um, HIV and, um, sorry, uh, with uh, hepatitis C uh, virus, genotype one and six without cirrhosis, achieved rates of SVR12 of more than 93% with all oral, once daily, ribavirin free, pangenotypic, lecaprevir, and pibrantasvir um, association. So about 100%, that means 33 patients of HCV genotype 1 and HIV co-infected patients without cirrhosis achieved SVR12 after 8 or 12 weeks of treatment with the same combination, that, which I will uh, call a GP, that's a return of your free regimen. So what is GP? Glecaprevir, that's a pangenotypic and it's for, uh, and a 3 4 uh, protease inhibitor, and Pibrantasvir, it's a genotypic and S5 A inhibitor. So now it's co formulated in a GP pill. And in vitro, this association showed a high barrier to resistance, and it was potent. Again, a lot of um, NS uh, variants, NS3, NS5A uh, variants, and uh, there was a synergistic antiviral activity between the two drugs. Um, so for clinical uh, pharmacokinetics and metabolism, that's a once daily oral dosing with food, minimal metabolism and primary biliary excretion and a real negligible renal expression. So what was the, the study design of Expedition 2? So that's a phase three multicenter global study evaluating eight or 12 week treatment, so it's not randomized, eight week for patient without cirrhosis and 12 weeks for patients with cirrhosis without or uh, all were with compensated cirrhosis. And patients were enrolled in a wide variety of countries, Australia, Belarus, France, Germany, Poland, Puerto Rico, Russian Federation, UK, and US. You have here the key eligibility criteria. So they were all adults over 18 with a BMI over 18, chronic HIV infection, but that's a pangenotypic association. So across all genotypes, one, two, three, four, five, six, and a positive result for HIV. And the patients were either treatment naive or treatment experience with interferon, PEG interferon and RIBA, or soft PEG and RIBA. Some key exclusion criteria are listed here. Uh, no uh, HCV treatment um, with a DAA other than sofosbuvir, no HBV co-infection, and no abnormal laboratory values per protocol. The cirrhosis was defined either with a liver biopsy or surrogate markers, biochemical scores, and you see here uh, the list of abnormal laboratory values. Patients were treated with antiretrovirals or naive of treatment, but in that case they had to have a CD4 count above 500 or, 90 or 29 percent. Or when they were treated, they had to be on a stable ART regimen for at least eight weeks prior to screening. And you have all uh, here listed the, the agents um, that could be prescribed with the GP. The study endpoint, so the primary endpoint was the SVR12, with a non-inferiority 6% margin to 96% for SVR12 rate. Secondary endpoint was on treatment, virologic failure and post-treatment relapse, and we had a few additional assessments, adverse events and laboratory abnormalities, 
and uh, the next generation sequencing was also performed to identify baseline polymorphism and treatment emergence substitutions in NS3 and NS5 A regions. Regarding now the baseline demographics and disease characteristics, you have here in the table the patients without cirrhosis, eight weeks of treatment, more than 100, 170, uh, and 37, and patients with cirrhosis, 12 weeks of treatment, 16. So you can see that all genotypes were represented, but the patients were mainly from genotype 1 and then some genotype uh, 2 and a few genotype 4, uh, 2, and 6. Regarding now the characteristics of uh, hepatitis C, you see that 16 patients, as I told you, had cirrhosis, and in patients without cirrhosis, they all had the pretty mild fibrosis. Among the patients who were treatment experienced, around 20%, you see that the most prescribed treatment was peg interferon and riba or interferon and riba. Regarding now the characteristics pertaining to the HIV infection, all were pretty mildly um, immunosuppressed, CD4 count above 500, a few had no antiretroviral therapy, and most of the patients were treated with raltegravir or dolutegravir. Now regarding the baseline polymorphism, most of the patients had known, but a few patients had NS5A polymorphism. And now the result, the main results, the SVR12, so you see that with this combination we almost reach 100% um, efficacy, 98%, and in modified ITT that's 99%. One patient with a genotype 3 infection and cirrhosis had on treatment virologic failure at week 8, and this patient was not very compliant. Regarding now the adverse events, most of the patients had an adverse events, but those adverse events were very, very mild and was mostly fatigue. In the laboratory abnormalities, we saw nothing that had to be noted. So one patient had a grade 3 total bilirubin elevation at day 10 until day 31, and then the levels normalized and no patient had met a pre-specified criteria for failure to maintain HIV suppression during the treatment period. So in summary, 98% overall SVR12 with no relapses in co-infected patients with or without cirrhosis following eight weeks or 12 weeks of GP respectively was noted. SVR12 was not impacted by high baseline viral load, cirrhosis status, or any other baseline factor. So the non-inferiority to historical standard of care was definitely achieved. This association was very well tolerated with a similar safety profile in co-infected patients with or without cirrhosis. No real serious adverse events and clinically sig significant laboratory abnormalities or treatment discontinuation were very rare. 99% FZR12 rate with no virological failure was observed in patients treated with eight weeks or so without cirrhosis. So, as a final conclusion, we may say from this trial that the GP regimen could be the first eight-week pangenotypic treatment options for HCV, HIV co-infected patients without cirrhosis. I would like to express uh, the gratitude of all the co-authors of all the co the co -authors of the patients who participated to the study and their families, and um, to the study investigators and the staff in the medical center. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any question from the floor? So it seems like it's a very promising drug, very high uh, viral efficacy and less side effect. So, any concerning about the drug-drug interaction between ART, especially in resource-limited setting, that we usually use the drug differently from 
your study, so mostly like an effervescence. Yeah, you're right. In the study, although a wide range of antiretroviral could be prescribed, most of the patients were on uh, anti-integrase and no uh, on the protease inhibitor. So I have, I think, a few, um, a few backup because I think that's a very good point to discuss with DDI. So in the future, SMPC uh, is going to be contraindicated with atazanavir, so you can see why, because the exposure of glecaprevir because of atazanavir is really high, and especially uh, in patients with advanced liver disease, uh, it might trigger an elevation um, in uh, transaminases. And then with darinavir, for example, or lopinavir, won't be contraindicated but not recommended, again, because of this um, hepatic uh, safety, uh, but it's not recommended, which means that if the patients can't be treated with other um, ARV, then it could be prescribed and you can do um, therapeutic drug monitoring and um, just follow up for uh, transaminases. And then um, you have to... Uh, the effervescence uh, is not recommended either, but it's more uh, because it decreases the exposure to, gl to glecaprevir and pibrantasvir, so we might, uh, we, we, we might face um, uh, risk of failure uh, of HCV treatment. Otherwise, there is very, very few uh, DDIs with ARV. And maybe I can show this, uh, this slide as well, that's a summary of what is uh, contraindicated, so you hear. You see here, cross, and then um, not recommended. Uh, hi, Karin. Thank you for excellent presentation. Uh, regarding the, the patients with a breakthrough, do you have any PK data or a resistance data? No, not yet. It's ongoing. Okay, thank you. So, so it seems like a majority of the hepatitis C study, they have very few uh, women. Any concerning about hepatitis C drug and hormonal, a hormone. Oh, you mean like contraception? Yes, the con contraception or, use. Um, actually, I don't have that kind of data in my head, uh, but um, it will come, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, that's a good question, and, and, and in any case, you know, females should, not, uh, should be treated for hepatitis C, and especially uh, in, um, in, in the perspective of pregnancy and try to, to treat before the pregnancy, and, and, and no, um, no DIA combination is uh, contraindicated uh, in that case. So. But, of course, it has to be taken into consideration and checked interactions, and we have very good websites for that. And, and uh, the, the last question for me is about the uh, polymorphism. Do we need yes. to, to do it or not? Because oh, no, no, use no. Not no, no impact of baseline polymorphism on the efficacy of treatment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent talk. <laughs> so, we move from the hepatitis C to the another important topic is metabolic disease and liver fibrosis. So which is a very common, not just in HIV, I think in general population as well. When I look at our audience, so maybe you have that as well. So just listen to uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Mort, uh, Lamont. She is a hepatologist from Imperial College of London. And she has been working with the uh, liver disease, uh, fatty liver disease for many years. So today, uh, we, are, uh, we are lucky to, to have her here to listen to her talk. So she's going to talk on the uh, metabolic syndrome and obesity are the cornerstone of liver fibrosis in HIV mono-infected patients, the result of the MetaFib study. Please. Thank you very much. So it's my great pleasure to be here today and to present the results of the MetaFib study, which is uh, a French study, and uh, I spent quite a lot of time with my colleagues in Paris, in France, even if I am uh, now based in uh, London. So <clears throat> this is my uh, disclosure. 
So what's the rationale of the Metafib uh, study? Uh, over the last uh, decades, metabolic syndrome and its hepatic manifestation, which is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, have emerged as new concerns in HIV-infected subjects. And we estimate today that about 25% of the HIV patients are diagnosed with metabolic syndrome, and about 35% of HIV mono-infected patients are diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, however, um, in HIV mono-infected patients, liver fibrosis and its pathophysiology have been uh, poorly assessed, and this is something that we have confirmed recently in a systematic review. So the Metafib study um, had two main uh, objectives. So the first objective was to assess the impact of metabolic syndrome on the proportion and severity of liver fibrosis in HIV mono-infected patients. And secondly, uh, we aimed to analyze the association between metabolic syndrome, liver fibrosis, and markers of adipose tissue and macrophage activation. Um, the methods, uh, the Metafib study is a single center exposed and non-exposed cohort of HIV mono-infected patients without excessive alcohol consumption, without viral hepatitis co-infections or any other cause of chronic liver disease. The exposure was defined by the presence of metabolic syndrome according to international criteria. Patients non-exposed to the metabolic syndrome were matched to exposed patients, so with metabolic syndromes, on age, sex, and HIV, uh, and duration of HIV infection. Liver fibrosis was estimated by the level of liver stiffness measured by the fibroscan device. And then we assessed a panel of inflammatory markers, including adipokines, leptin, adiponectin, interleukin-6, CRP and CD163 and CD14 as uh, biomarkers of macrophage activation. So what's the results? We screened uh, almost 500 patients um, because some of them had invalid liver uh, stiffness measurement. We finally analyzed 405 patients. So two, uh, under, uh, 203 with metabolic syndrome and 202 without metabolic syndrome. So this is a summary of uh, the characteristics of the study population. So you can see that they were, patients were mainly males, um, relatively old, with a median mean age at 53. But patients with metabolic syndrome were older than patients without metabolic syndrome. Importantly, there was no difference uh, between the duration of HIV infection, CD4 cells count, and HIV viral load. As expected, patients with metabolic syndrome had obviously uh, higher metabolic disorders, and you can see uh, that 13% of them were obese, and almost 50% of them had insulin resistance. Patients with metabolic syndromes had higher liver enzymes, and in terms of inflammatory markers, they were all uh, higher in patients with metabolic syndrome, except for CRP and IL-6, and uh, of course the level of adiponectin, which is a marker of insulin resistance, was lower in patients with metabolic syndrome. So this is the results of the prevalence of uh, liver fibrosis and its severity. So you can see that patients with metabolic syndrome here had higher level of liver stiffness measurement. 25% of patients with metabolic syndrome had suspected clinically significant liver fibrosis over F2, and almost 10% here had suspected cirrhosis. So much more than the patients without metabolic syndrome. In terms of inflammatory markers and fibrosis, all the markers except the CD14 were um, uh, more elevated according to the severity uh, of the uh, liver fibrosis. 
After adjustment on the presence of metabolic syndrome, we found all these parameters associated with liver fibrosis and its severity. So BMI, waist circumference, obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, GGT, and the level of leptin, which reflects the fat mass, the uh, leptin to adiponectin ratio, which reflects insulin resistance, and the level of CD163, uh, which is a biomarker of macrophage activation. So importantly, uh, liver transaminases levels, ART exposure, or any HIV parameters were not associated with the degree of liver fibrosis. Now, in multivariate analysis, we found that metabolic syndrome and obesity were the only parameters strongly and consistently associated with the degree of liver fibrosis, as you can see here. So to conclude, our study suggests that uh, HIV mono-infected patients with metabolic syndrome are at high risk, uh, high risk of liver fibrosis, and therefore they should be systematically screened for liver fibrosis, and this irrespective of the levels of transaminases or HIV parameters. Secondly, we believe that the mass fat, which can be measured by the BMI or the circulating level of leptin, is strongly associated with liver fibrosis, independently of HIV parameters or ART exposure. And uh, our study suggests that adipose tissue through leptin, insulin resistance, and macrophage activation are probably key players in the development of liver fibrosis in this population. I just um, would like to draw your attention that our study was based on Fibroscan, which was not uh, highly validated in that population. We did not do any liver biopsy. We did not assess steatosis or the presence of NASH. So I would like uh, to thank all my colleagues from Saint Antoine Hospital, Paris, and the patients, and of course, INSERM, ANRS, and EMEA for the scientific and financial support. Thank you. Thank you. So the time of question. Yes, please, Jürgen. So, well, a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank My name you. is Jürgen Rock. So I just have a question, so, because I think you sort of nicely showed the importance of fat mass or obesity, which are obviously difficult topics to talk about <laughs> when you're obese yourself. But, <clears throat> You have no correlation or association with HIV markers. And I just always wonder if you look at the HIV drugs, because some of them can cause insulin resistance. HIV itself can cause or contribute to insulin resistance. You sort of wonder how can you, on the one hand, say insulin resistance causes sort of more fibrosis, but on the other hand, you say there's no association with HIV markers, but then that's what HIV and some of the HIV drugs do. So my question is, do you have a lot of drugs in there which cause is there, mm -hmm. or do you have already all the favorable, you know, 2016, 17 drugs in that court? Or can you sort of distangle this sort of issue between HIV contribution, drug contribution, but then in your analysis, no contribution for insulin resistance? Thank you, Jürgen, for your question. So <clears throat> actually, our population is a population of old uh, patients. I'm not sure I've, I have shown this, but the mean duration was more than 15 years, and they've been exposed to a lot of drugs, including hepatotoxic drug, D40-DDI, some PI. So I have the feeling that the, this population, and it was quite a large population, is relatively representative of these to address these questions. However, uh, in terms of HIV virological parameters, we selected patients which were, who were well immunocontrolled. So I'm not sure that this study can address this question. So I agree, the question of uh, indirect mechanism through the viral load CD4, I don't know, it's not completely elucidated. Mm. Yes, please. <clears throat> Great talk. Uh, just uh, Juan Berenguer from Madrid. Uh, just a question. To what extent are we sure that the increased stiffness found in patients, obese patients, are due to 
fibrosis or fat? Because, it's, mm, because it, we have some studies performed in the mm, past in which we were validating a fibrous scan in which fat increases mm, actually increases the liver stiffness. Sure. It's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, and this is why I really insisted on the fact that the main limitation of this study is the fact that we have based our analysis on liver stiffness measurement. So we should not forget that when we do a fiber scan, we measure the liver stiffness and not the liver fibers, as I fully agree. So we've looked um, first to address your question regarding the steatosis. So in that study, we did not assess um, the degree of steatosis and we did not perform any liver biopsy. But um, in another study that we are currently um, doing in a Euro European group, we found that um, liver stiffness measurement in that kind of population is not related to the degree of steatosis measured by ultrasonography or liver biopsy. However, we have some concerns regarding the diagnostic accuracy, the performances of um, fiber scan, which in in another population that we have um, assessed, it doesn't work very, very well. So we try to confirm or not this. And um, so probably in case of suspicion of significant fibrosis, we need to do a liver biopsy in this patient. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Bart Renders from Rotterdam. Your first conclusion was that in all patients with metabolic syndrome, we should assess for liver fibrosis. Isn't that a little bit too early to conclude, given all the limitations of the, the measurement that you are doing? The study was very well performed with the tools you have, but screening everybody with metabolic syndrome for liver fibrosis? Uh, no, I think it's, it's important. So... Um Metabolic syndrome is observed in 25% of HIV patients. Um, we will, I think we will uh, see a lot uh, more and more patients with HIV mono-infection. And I just underline this as well because a lot of ID physicians won't um, screen their patients only if there is any elevation of liver transaminases. So I think well, even... <laughs> Even if there is a limitation in terms of fiber scan and the absence of liver biopsy, I think the study uh, strongly supports um, the role of the adipose tissue, the metabolic syndrome. So I think it doesn't cost much to do, even if you can't do a fiber scan, but maybe another biochemical test, at least to screen patients with pre-cirrhosis or cirrhosis, and whatever the level of transaminase is. But, but then... Even if the test is okay, then you find fibro fibrosis. And as a general policy to screen them all, and then what, what we do then? We find fibrosis, so we let them exercise. It doesn't work. And yeah, so uh, good point as well. So I think uh, hopefully <laughs> that will change. As you probably know, there are a lot of drugs coming on the market. And we hope that uh, these trials will be open soon for HIV infected patients. Okay, so the last question, please. Uh, hi, Samantha Becega from San Francisco. Um, I'm talking about what we can do for patients with a fatty liver. In our clinic, we're trying to screen patients with fatty liver um, for, to, to see which one has have fibrosis by doing a FIB4, which is a measurement that is based mm -hmm. on transaminases, right? So, um, when the FIB4 is more than 1.3, then we consider doing a fiber scan and then maybe referring the patient to a study because these studies um, without HIV. But now you're telling us that the transaminases do not correlate. So I'm thinking that these patients will have a low FIB4 and then, you know, use it to screen these patients to, see, to send them for fibrous cancer. No, I, I think it's fine. You have to start somewhere. So it's perfectly fine to start by screening patients on liver transaminases levels. And I think FIB4 can work quite well 
uh, at least to rule out the cirrhotic patients. What I want to say is, and it, this is something we observe in non-HIV patients, the normality of transaminases does not exclude the diagnosis of fibrosis and NASH. Yes. In the HIV population, you think it may not, it may correlate even less to, with fibrosis, the FIB4? Your FIB4 is based on the liver transaminases, of course, so yes. Support for the speaker, I can uh, say that in the uh, SIV-infected non-human primates, uh, we almost never see increases in the transaminase, uh, but we see modifications in the fibrosis markers and uh, very severe steatosis in the liver. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for your excellent talk. The last presentation uh, will be called Predictive Factors Associated with Liver Fibrosis and Steatosis by Transient Elastography in HIV Mono-Infected Patients Under Long-Term Combinant Heteroviral Therapy, the Prospect HIV Study, and will be presented by Hugo Perazzo. Hugo is a, a clinical researcher in the, the National Institute of Infectious Disease, Fiocruz. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to Thank you, the scientific committee, to give me the opportunity to present my work as a horror presentation and to support this abstract, awarding me with a scholarship to be here. I advise you that data was updated since the abstract submission, but the take-home message uh, remained the same. We have nothing to disclose. As you know, uh, in general population, it's well known that uh, increase of fat Fat, uh, free fat acid leads to insulin state status and uh, causing uh, fat liver accumulation. In presence of oxidative stress and activation of inflammatory cascade may lead to NASH, steatohepatitis, and development of cirrhosis, uh, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and its, complica its complications. However, uh, data on prevalence of liver steatosis and fibrosis uh, in HIV patients and factors associated with, associated with this condition is, uh, remain scarce, and uh, we uh, don't know if the chronic inflammation status of HIV infections and the hepatotoxicity associated with antiretroviral therapy may play a role uh, in this process. So the, the aim of the study was to evaluate factors associated with liver fibrosis and steatosis in HIV mono-infected patients under long-term combined antiretroviral therapy. At our center, we have a cohort of HIV patients, about uh, 4,000 patients that have been following since 1990. Uh, we are collecting uh, ART regime, CD4 count, viral load, co-infections, and AIDS-related events in those patients. And this study, it's a cross-section analysis of a longitudinal project called Prospect HIV that have been evaluating the HIV patients using non-invasive markers since 2015, uh, and we included in this analysis HIV-infected patients under uh, long-term antiretroviral therapy, more than six months, and without viral hepatitis co-infection. Uh, the, following, the following procedures were performed at the same day, uh, clinical evaluation including anthropometric measures, alcohol intake assessment by the audit score, uh, presence of comorbidity and comedication use, history of HIV infection and antiretroviral therapy currently and previous, patients performed fasting blood tests, and transient elastography by Fibroscan was performed by this, a single experienced uh, operator. As you may know, transient elastography uh, can assess liver fibrosis by liver stiffened measurement and liver steatosis by control attenuation parameter. Uh, Fibroscan examinations were considered reliable uh, based on uh, validated criteria. Metabolic features and metabolic syndrome were uh, defined according to the International Diabetes Federation, and we classify our patients uh, 
for current and previous and cumulative ART as backbone AZT versus TDF and core drugs as non-NUC versus PI intergase inhibitor. The cum for cumulative ART, we analyze years of use and most used drug during the HIV infection for backbone and core drug class. The outcomes were a presence of liver fibrosis by uh, liver stiffness measures higher or equal to 8 kilopascal in reliable uh, fibrous examination and liver steatosis uh, as cap higher than 250 in reliable cap measures. All uh, variables that were associated with the outcomes in univariate analysis were entering the mood variate logistic regressions adjusted always for age and sex. Here you can see the flow chart of the study. So uh, 489 HIV patients were included in the prospect study from June 2015 to March of this year. Nine four patients were excluded, most of them uh, related to a, a coronary viral hepatitis co-infection. Uh, therefore, uh, 395 HIV mono-infected patients were included in uh, this study. Fibrosis assessment was reliable in 93% of patients, 367, and uh, steatosis assessment was reliable in 344 patients, it means 84% uh, of our sample. Here's the baseline characteristic of patients. Uh, most patients were female. Uh, median age was 45 years. Uh, median BMI was 25.7. Uh, 32% uh, of patients had a metabolic syndrome. And uh, liver function tests was uh, mainly normal in this population. Duration of HIV infections in this population are median time of 10 years. Uh, median CD4 count was higher than 600 in this patient, and a quarter of patients had an average CD4 lower than 100 cells. Patients were under uh, retroviral therapy for a median time of seven years, and uh, as a current treatment, as you can see, most patients were treated by a TDF backbone and a PI or intragase inhibitor as a core drug class. However, you can see here that 43% uh, of our population, uh, the AZT backbone was the most drug used during the HIV infection. Liver stiffness, the median liver stiffness of our patients were 5.3 kilopascal, and 9% of patients had a presence of fibrosis based on the cutoff uh, chosen. Cap measure, the median cap measurement was 230, uh, and the prevalence of steatosis was 35% in our uh, sample. These slides show, show you the uni and multivariate analysis uh, for identification of factors associated with fibrosis, and as you can see here, uh, a CD4 count lower than 200 cells was strongly associated with presence of fibrosis independent of uh, confounding factors in a, in a model adjusted for age and sex. Here, uh, this slide shows you the uni and multivariate analysis for identification of factors associated with steatosis. So, uh, in a first step, we uh, did a model with the metabolic features, and as you can see here, central obesity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia were uh, independently associated with presence of steatosis in HIV mono-infected patients. And in a second step, we uh, reanalyze replacing the individual parameters by the, by the, for the presence of uh, metabolic syndrome. And it have, we had similar results. The presence of metabolic syndrome was independently associated with presence of steatosis in these patients. However, duration of HIV infection, duration of uh, antiretroviral therapy, and the uh, use of AZT uh, as a backbone drug during uh, cumulative time were uh, associated with steatosis in the univariate analysis, but not in the multivariate analysis. However, uh, these variables might be correlated and uh, should not be in the same model by the risk of collinearity. 
So uh, we analyze the correlation between these uh, variables and the variance inflection factors of variables entered in our multivariate uh, model. Uh, VIF, the variance inflation factors, quantifies the severity of multicollinearity, and as you can see, he, see here, the three variables has the, the highest VIF values, and this variable was highly correlated. So we, uh, in, a, in the third, third step, we uh, in, in introduced entered these variables in separate multivariate models. Uh, duration of HIV infection, duration of antiretroviral therapy, cumulative use of AZT as backbone were entered uh, in H1 in one different model. As you can note, uh, central obesity, type 2 diabetes, and dyslipidemia were always uh, independently associated with steatosis in all models, and duration of HIV uh, infection in model A, uh, duration of antiretroviral therapy in model B, and uh, cumulative use of AZT as backbone drug in model C were associated with steatosis independently of presence of uh, metabolic features. So to conclude, in mono-infected patients, low CD4 count was independently associated with presence of liver fibrosis by transient elastography. Metabolic features such as central obesity, type 2 diabetes, and uh, dyslipidemia, as well as metabolic syndrome were independently associated with presence of liver steatosis by CAP. And a higher duration of antiretroviral therapy, especially by AZT as backbone drug, was associated with steatosis independently of metabolic features. I'd like to thank you, all participants of the PROSPECT HIV study. I'd like to thank you, uh, my colleagues from the lab clean at uh, INIFIO Cruz. Uh, I cannot give you a list of names by the risk of forgetting someone. I'd like to especially thank you, uh, Dr. Valdilev Veloso, that is our director of the National Institute of uh, Infectious Disease, Evandro Chagas, and Dr. Beatrice Greenstein, that's head of our department for supporting this study, and also thank you the agents that have been supporting our project. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Hugo, for this very nice presentation. It's now open to questions. Uh, you, uh, just, just to make a link with the previous presentation, uh, I, I, you have shown that uh, metabolic syndrome was uh, related to uh, steatosis, but uh, I have not seen the, 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 the relation with uh, fibrosis. Have you tried to, to, to link with uh, fibrosis on univariate analysis? Yeah, yeah, we uh, did an univariate analysis, uh, including uh, presence of, as we did for, for steatosis, and only uh, type 2 diabetes uh, was, has a trend for the presence of fibrosis with a p-value of 0.06, but not the presence of uh, metabolic syndrome Metab or other uh, metabolic features. Okay. So because of the high proportion of patients with dyslipidemia, uh, so just like to ask about the statin used, whether it has any effect to the fibro scan or fibrosis that you have um, measured, or not? the statin used? Yeah, uh, the statin use was uh, part of the definition of dyslipidemia according to International Diabetes Federation. If a patient was using statin, it, he, was con he or she was considered as a presence of dyslipidemia. I cannot, sh I cannot tell you uh, here, uh, the exact proportion of patients that were using statins, but we have uh, this data. So, it seems like we don't have any more questions. So, our sections come to the end. I would like to thank our great audience and our fantastic speakers, and finally, the co-chair for the section. Thank you very much. <laughs>